I welcome everyone to the first video in Philosophy 101 based upon the text Consider Philosophy. The ideal starting place for an introductory course is to raise the question, what is philosophy? While it's a difficult question to answer, simply asking the question begins the process of philo philosophical thought. So it's worth noting that while the etymology of the word is Greek, philosophy itself is a worldwide phenomenon and clearly predates the Greek culture. Uh, a lot of times this is what you would find on day one of a philosophy class. We'll tell you uh, here is the Greek origin of the word philosophia. Philo means lover, sophia means wisdom, and so philosophy implies the lover of wisdom. And that leaves us with this notion that somehow philosophy is a Greek invention. But philosophy is as old as mankind and it's found on every corner of the globe. It's just that the Greeks were the ones who coined the term. I think it's useful to draw allusion here to various attempts to define philosophy because it is a very difficult thing to try to define. Here we see Plato who says philosophy begins in wonder. And I'm sure there's a lot of truth in that. The first person who raised that question, why, to anything, was likely our first philosopher. George Hegel says, thus reflection, thinking things over in a general way involves the principle, which also is the beginning of philosophy. So simply pondering things, thinking about questions. A.C. Grayling says philosophy is the art of thinking beyond the everyday. In fact, uh, Grayling's definition probably comes closest to the heart of philosophy, at least in my opinion. While most people live their lives concerned with mundane everyday affairs, the philosopher is going to ask the big questions. While the average person wants to know what's for supper or if they're able to afford the gas to get back home, the philosopher seeks to understand the na uh, nature of existence. Certain questions such as, does life have meaning? Is there a God? Do I possess free will? Is anything objectively certain? What is good? You know, these are the types of questions that we concern ourselves with when we look at the issue of philosophy. Philosophy is really an ongoing dialogue which is more than 5,000 years old. It's attempted to answer these deep questions. Yet as one engages in the study of philosophy, one realizes that the questions of the philosopher are almost never answered definitively. Bertrand Russell, a very famous English philosopher, tells us that the questions we ask are more important than the answers. One shouldn't worry about this fact because actually the questions of philosophy, the types that they are, they probably will never have a definitive answer. But the questions that we raise at any given time, they tell us a great deal about who we are, both as individuals and collectively at that moment in history. Now, of course, while Russell says that it's the questions that matter, Russell, along with everyone else who asks the questions, do, of course, hope to discover an answer somewhere along the way. For the philosopher, the key to that discovery is critical thinking and logic. Oftentimes, students will ask why they're required to take philosophy or what purpose it serves. In critical thinking, we find that answer. The student will be taught to think and reason as the philosopher does perhaps in the words of Ayn Rand, to say, I surrender to nothing but logic. Logic is dealing with arguments, the study of arguments, the creation of arguments, the evaluation of arguments. And so it's important to understand what an argument is. Everyone is familiar with the idea of asking a question and receiving an answer of some sort.
when we participate in an argument in daily life, it's frequently a matter of he said, she said, or yes it is, no it is, as in this hilarious uh, Monty Python sketch where um, Michael Palin walks into the Office of Arguments, which is uh, headed by John Cleese, and asks for an argument. And he ends up paying for a five-minute argument, and Cleese says, uh, well, you have to pay first. And Palin says, yes, I did. And Cleese says, no, I didn't, and back and forth for several minutes. Um, that's the way a lot of people think of an argument as being. But for the philosopher, the argument implies something very different. And the bulk of the first chapter of your text aims at giving the student the basic tools of critical thinking. The student is going to discover an argument as a means to convince another person to accept the conclusion that he or she wishes to advance. In an argument, the conclusion may be defined as the thing one wishes to prove, while the premises may be defined as the evidence one offers in support of that claim. Now when we discuss different types of arguments in logic and critical thinking, there are two main types. There's deductive and inductive. Deductive arguments imply certainty, but they don't really give any new knowledge because the conclusion is already contained within the premises. So for example, all cats are feline, all leopards are cats, therefore all leopards are feline. If the premises are true, the conclusion must also be true. The conclusion is forced by the truth of those con uh, uh, premises. So as long as the premises are true, there's no way that that conclusion could be false. Inductive arguments imply probability. There's an element of guesswork to an inductive argument. However, one is potentially led towards new knowledge by this leap beyond the premises. And for this reason, most of our knowledge comes from induction rather than from deduction. For example, it's rained every day for the last two weeks, therefore it will rain again tomorrow. This makes a best guess based upon the available data at hand. Now, as you're all aware, weather forecasters use this type of uh, thing all the time, and frequently those weather forecasters are wrong. Um, you know, being a weather forecaster is the only job in the world where you can be wrong half the time and still keep your job. So um, that's because it's based upon induction. It's based upon a best guess, based upon the information that we have at hand. Now, regardless of which type of argument we choose to make, it's important to maintain a level of cordiality. Arguments can certainly get heated, particularly if we have strong feelings about a topic. But if we get caught up in the moment, critical thinking is usually the first casualty. The more excited we get about something, the more animated, the more, uh, you know, the, the louder we become in our argument, the less likely that logic is going to prevail throughout it. When we fail to reason correctly, fallacies occur. Um, and these undermine or even destroy our arguments. This chapter warns against only a few major fallacies that I want to highlight here. First, irrelevant reasoning, or what's sometimes called the red herring fallacy. This is drawing a conclusion that's not warranted, or in some cases not even related to the premises. For example, as we see here, there has been an increase in petty crime lately, so we must reinstate the death penalty immediately. Well, even if it's true that there's been an increase in petty crime, that has nothing to do with the charge or the uh, desire to reinstate the death penalty, since you don't get the death penalty for petty crime. So the conclusion is irrelevant to the premises. The second is called the ad hominem fallacy. The ad hominem fallacy is when you attack the person rather than the argument. So for example, Dr. Jones says we should cut back on carbon emissions, but he's the advisor for the young communists, so we shouldn't listen to him. Whether or not Dr. Jones is a communist or anything else doesn't alter the fact that his argument should be treated in its own accord. We should look at what he has to say and evaluate the argument 
based upon um, you know but based upon its reasons it doesn't matter who the person is it doesn't matter what the person's background is we need to look at what the argument says and evaluate the argument when we attack the person then this is an ad hominem the straw man fallacy is creating a weaker version of one's opponent's argument in order to make the argument easier to attack. For example, <coughs> Mr. Silverman has argued that there should be no prayer in school. So obviously he's advocating atheism. But we've seen that that didn't work in Russia. So why should we try atheism here? Okay. Now we don't know what Mr. Silverman's argument really is, but there's lots of good reasons why we should not allow prayer in public schools. It doesn't necessarily mean that he's advocating atheism. But it's a lot easier to throw out a politically charged word like atheism and have people jump to your side than it is to attack the actual argument. So he's created an alternative version of his opponent's argument, one that's full of holes, one that's easy to attack. And that's the one that he's uh, chosen to attack. And finally, there's the appeal to inappropriate authority, which is treating someone who is not an authority in a particular area as if they were an authority. So, for example, Toby Keith says that Ford makes the best trucks on the market, therefore it must be true. Well, you know, just because a popular celebrity says something is true doesn't mean that it is, unless that celebrity has direct knowledge of the product. Um, but Toby Keith is not an expert on building or making uh, trucks. Perhaps doesn't know anything about the inner workings of the mechanism. But yet, because he's a popular celebrity, a lot of people will just jump on the bandwagon and listen to what he has to say anyway. We need to make sure that the people that we're listening to, the people we're quoting, uh, the people that we're treating as an authority, are actually an authority in the field. At the end of this chapter there is a section that deals with Plato's work, The Apology. And I wanted to turn to that briefly so we can see Plato presenting Socrates as the ultimate philosopher where he raises the big questions and we can see some of the arguments that he's offered which for the most part are good examples of critical thought. Socrates lived from 470 to 399 BC and Plato is his primary um, autobiographer. In Plato's writings, in the early days of his writings, he writes four works which make up what's known as the trial and death of Socrates. Uh, you have the Euthyphro, the Apology, the Crito, and the Phaedo. In the uh, Euthyphro, we see Socrates coming into court. The Apology, which is from the Greek word apologia, meaning defense, is his defense trial. And the Crito deals with a period that Socrates spends in jail waiting his execution, and the Phaedo deals with the final conversation that Socrates has prior to dying from drinking the poison hemlock. Now Socrates has been brought in to court to answer a couple of major charges which we'll get to in a moment but he does something rather unique and that is that he brings up three minor charges. He levels charges against himself because he anticipates that this is sort of his last opportunity to clear himself. Because the way that the Athenian court system worked was very different from the way that we think of courts today. You have a large body of citizens who come in to watch this and these people become the jury, the judges sitting in the court. Most of them walk into that courtroom with their mind already made up. They know how they're going to decide on this. They've come for the show. On the one hand, the great philosopher Socrates. On the other hand, Miletus, one of the greatest sophists of the day. Let's hear the arguments. Let's enjoy a day's worth of, of entertainment. 
there was no opportunity to think about what was going to take place. There was no time to deliberate after the fact. There's an immediate vote that's taken. So Socrates realizes that he's already lost walking into the courtroom, but he's going to make a good show of it. And he wants to clear his name of a couple of things, so he brings these minor charges against himself. Firstly is the idea that Socrates pursues natural science. Natural science is delving into the origins of the universe, questioning the uh, beginnings of nature. And at the time, that was the domain of religion, not of philosophy. And so Socrates said that, you know, you have claimed that I've been doing these things, but I ask you now, have you ever heard me say any of these things? Have you ever heard me talk about any of this? And the court says, no. So the very people that have been saying things about him behind his back are now confronted directly to his face, and they have to say, no, Socrates, we've never heard you talk about these things. You deal with the questions of knowledge. You deal primarily with questions of ethics. But you've never delved into the origins of the universe. The second charge is that Socrates is basically a sophist himself. He takes money for giving lessons. Socrates appeals to his own poverty for this and says, if I have been doing so, I must not have many students because... I, I live a very impoverished existence. And again, the people sitting around say, yeah, you're right, Socrates. You may go up and talk to people in the streets. You may engage people in conversation, but you've never held a class. You've never charged anybody money for anything. So he clears himself of those two charges. The third charge is the more interesting one. The claim that Socrates is arrogant, believing himself to be the wisest of all people. Now the way this comes about is that the oracle of Delphi, and an oracle is a messenger of the gods, the oracle of Delphi says, Socrates, you are the wisest of all people. But Socrates didn't want to believe this because he's always going around professing his own ignorance, saying, I don't know, I'm just trying to find out, I'm trying to discover. And so he goes around and he tries to find all these different people who know more than he does. He wants to disprove the oracle. And sure enough, he finds people that knows things he doesn't. But he also discovers that these people, because they have a certain degree of knowledge, they start to profess to other knowledge as well. Because the carpenter knows how to craft wood, he also believes he knows how to blow glass. Because the poet knows how to craft beautiful words, he believes he also knows about politics and statecraft. And so Socrates has to come to the conclusion that the oracle was in fact right. He was the wisest person because he knew his limitations. He understood that he didn't know everything. And so we could argue then that the greatest wisdom is the wisdom of knowing your own limitations, of knowing that you don't know, and being open to that fact. And that's what Socrates does. Now, he's not an arrogant person, because the, or the oracle is not saying, you and you alone are the wisest person. What the oracle is actually saying is that by example, or by analogy, Anyone like Socrates who recognizes their own limitations, that is a wise person. Now as we turn to the major charges, there are two major charges. One is the charge of corrupting the youth, and the other is the charge of inventing new gods. Corrupting the youth basically implies that he's teaching these young people to think for themselves. And inventing new gods, well, keep in mind that the ancient Greeks had a huge pantheon of deities, Zeus and Hera and Apollo and all of those, and each city-state had their particular deities that the people were expected to, uh, to worship. But here comes Socrates, and Socrates is really rejecting the deities to a large part. 
And instead he begins talking about Sophia, wisdom, knowledge. And that's essentially what is meant by it. Now is he talking about Sophia, the goddess of wisdom, or is he talking simply about wisdom itself? The fact is, there was no way really of telling, and so, they, uh, so Miletus charges him both with corrupting the youth and with inventing new gods. Now, with regards to the issue of corrupting the youth, Socrates, again, he knows that he's already been declared guilty, uh, so he's going to have some fun and run some circles around Miletus and basically make him look like an idiot. And so he begins to challenge him. You say that I am the corrupter of the youth, so obviously you must care a lot about the young people. So tell me, if I'm their corrupter, who is their improver? Who makes things better for them? And Miletus doesn't want to ask, but uh, he doesn't want to answer because he kind of senses something's up. But Socrates keeps pressing him, and eventually he leads him down this slippery slope until he makes the pronouncement that every single person in Athens, except for Socrates, is the improver, and Socrates alone is their corrupter. And so Socrates points out that, well, you know, that's really not very likely, is it? Because, first of all, if I were the only corrupter and everybody else was working to improve them, then how is it possible that one person could work against all of that good? It just isn't going to happen that way. And secondly, it isn't possible that everybody could be working for the good, for the betterment of the youth. Because it, it's sort of like the old adage of too many cooks spoil the broth. If you've got one or two people in the kitchen following the recipe, you've got a nice soup when you're done. But if you've got 20 people walking through and each one's putting in a pinch of this and a little bit of that, before long it becomes inedible. So even if your intention was good, not everybody knows what is best for the child. There's too many conflicting opinions and views. And so there's only a handful of people that could work to the good. And most anyone else, even if their intention was good, would probably be working towards the bad. So he never actually defends himself against the charge and says, no, I'm not corrupting the youth. What he does is turn the tables on Miletus and make him look like an idiot who has no idea of what he's talking about. When it comes to the idea of inventing new gods, he does something very similar. He says to Miletus, let me be very clear about what it is you're charging me with. Are you saying that I'm inventing new gods, that I'm getting the people to uh, worship deities other than the state gods? Or are you saying that I'm teaching atheism, that I'm teaching them that there should be no gods and we should not worship any? And Miletus jumps upon this opportunity and says, you are teaching atheism. So he changes the charge right there in the middle of the trial. You're teaching atheism, Socrates, because he knows that that is a very charged word and that's enough to... To, to get him executed right there. But he's just fallen into Socrates' trap. Socrates, just a few moments ago, talked about the Oracle of Delphi, the messenger of the gods. Now, if he accepts that there is a messenger of the gods, doesn't he also have to accept that there is a god? It may not be the same one that the sta uh, state represents, but he clearly is not an atheist. He must believe in some deity, Otherwise, where would the um, uh, you know uh, where would the message be coming from? Socrates is, of course, despite his best efforts, uh, going to be condemned to death, and he's deliberating a bit in the um, courtroom because his friends become very upset when this verdict is is heard. But he makes a couple of interesting arguments. He says that no matter how we look at it, death is a good thing. Because death is either a fading into nothingness, or it's a migrating to another place. And either one is better than carrying on as we are here. If we fade into nothingness, then all the pain, all the misery, all the suffering of the world that we live in is gone. 
and it's like your best night's sleep. You know, you lay down, your head hits the pillow, and you know nothing until you wake up the next morning. During that time, it's as if time was not even there. You knew nothing of it. So imagine that peace stretching on throughout all of eternity. Clearly that's a good thing. But if it's not that, then as many people believed at the time, death is a migration to some other place, perhaps into the realm of Hades. Now if that's the case, he says, that's also a good. Because think of all the people who had gone on before me, all the great philosophers, all the great thinkers, all the great writers. Imagine the conversations that I can now have with them. And so, Socrates um, says that whether death is fading into non-existence or whether it's going to some other place, it's a good, it's better than the pain, the misery, the suffering that we endure in this present world. And so, while he has been condemned to die, to drink the hemlock and leave this mortal world behind, he says to uh, everyone as he's leaving the courtroom, I go, I to go my way, you to go yours. Which is better? God only knows. Now this is one of my favorite lines in all of Plato's writing. Because basically what he's saying to the people is, look, you have condemned me to death, but you're all condemned to life. Which one of us got the better end of this deal? I have no idea, but I'm about to go find out, and you people are still going to be stuck here. Ha ha! That's Socrates. That's why we love this guy. Because that's the attitude that he had, even facing death. I think it's probably important to notice that Socrates is about 70 years old when this happens. Uh, had he been 25 or 30, he might have thought very differently about it, but... By this point, I think he's discovered what he can discover in our present world. And being the curious-minded individual that he is, he wants to carry on. Um, he wants to discover if there's anything more. And the only way he's going to do that is by leaving this world behind. So in essence, I think Socrates is ready and even welcoming of death. And he makes some interesting arguments to that effect.